Jersey Network presents Doctors Who, Old and New, with Eric Luskin and Patrick Daniel O'Neill. One day, I shall come back. Yes, I shall come back. Until then, there must be no regrets, no tears, no anxieties. Just go forward in all your beliefs and prove to me that I am not mistaken in mine. Hi everybody, Eric Luskin. We're here with Doctors Who Old and New, a very special preview of Patrick Troughton, Colin Baker, and coming to New Jersey Network next Saturday night at 9, William Hartnell. My co-host tonight, Patrick Daniel O'Neill, who writes for Starlog Magazine and also for Marvel Comics. And what is the significance of New Jersey Network bringing you uh, William Hartnell next week? Well, it's the first time it's ever been aired in the United States, and the important thing to remember is that Hartnell's Doctor is very different from anything we've seen before here in the United States in terms of, of Doctor Who. Uh, he's touchy, irritable, curmudgeonly, almost an anti-hero. Well, why don't we take a look at some of the episodes that New Jersey Network is going to be showing you, not only of William Hartnell, but also Patrick Troughton and, and Colin Baker. We start off with the very first episode ever, which was called An, an Unearthly Child. And that will be next Saturday night at 9 here on New Jersey Network, the very first Doctor Who ever. Following that will be the Daleks. Of course, the fascinating thing about that is that's what made Doctor Who a hit in Britain. The Edge of Destruction, the Keys of Marinus, the Aztecs are also there. All these are from the first season of William Hartnell, the Sensorites. Then in the second season, from that package, we bring you the Planet of Giants. The Dalek Invasion of Earth, which I believe introduced the Daleks, did it not? No, the, the Daleks was introduced in the second ah, story. Okay. The Rescue. The Romans, the Web Planet, and the Space Museum. That's why Pat is here, incidentally. He's the expert. The, <laughs> the Chase and the Time Meddler. The Time Meddler is the first time we meet somebody else from the Doctor's race, the Time Lords. Great. Now, all that's from the second season. Then we begin with the third season of William Hartnell, the Ark, the Gunfighters, the War Machines, and that wraps up William Hartnell. But then we start with the Patrick Troutons. Now, Patrick Troughton is an incredible character. We'll be discussing him a little bit later on. We have the Dominators, the Mind Robber, the Crotons, the Seeds of Death, and the War Games. Now, this is the longest one uh, that was ever done, or well, that no. exists, It's, a, it's right? the longest one that still exists. It's, it was done as 10 episodes in Britain, and we'll be showing it in two parts. Great. Now, the last Saturday of every month, beginning in October, we will be running Colin Baker stories. We begin with the Twin Dilemmas, the Attack of the Cybermen, Vengeance on Varos, The Mark of the Rani. Now, all of these are from Colin's first season. The Two Doctors, which features um, Patrick, Patrick Troughton, Time Lash, and Revelation of the Daleks. Now, all of these are, of course, from the Colin Baker package. We'll have an interview with Colin Baker coming up a little bit later on in the show. All of this is incredible news for Doctor Who fans because most of these episodes have not been seen here in this country. Right now, what we'd like to do is introduce you to the characters. William Hartnell is very different from the Doctors that we've been seeing recently, and Pat's going to tell you a little bit about the difference. Where did William Hartnell's characterization come from? A lot of it comes from William Hartnell himself. Uh, as I said, the character is tetchy, irritable, curmudgeonly, and that is, by all reports, a lot like what William Hartnell was. He was a, an old-time character actor in films and stage. This was the first television work he'd done. And much of it is, they said, play it as yourself, Bill. And that's what they did. Uh, as the series went on, he became a little less threatening, but he remained a fairly um, different character, a more difficult character to deal with. Now, he warms up a little bit as, uh, as the series goes on, does he not? Yes, he does. Uh, as we get to know him better and as they realize that this is going to be a character who must appeal to children, and children were a little off-put by uh, Bill Hartnell's early version of the character. Now, the Daleks, um, as you <laughs> corrected me, came in in episode two. Um, what do people have to look forward to the Daleks here? Well, you'll be good, interesting to see the early stages of them, how they're um, a little primitive. Uh, the interesting thing about the Daleks is that they became an incredible hit in Britain. Uh, they are what made Doctor Who a hit, even speaking, more than the Doctor Speaking of himself. what made Doctor Who a hit, let's get, take a look at the character of William Hartnell. This is from the episode you'll see next week. It is something from An Unearthly Child, featuring William Hartnell. One minute ago, we were trying desperately to get away from these savages. All right. Now we're helping them. 
You're a doctor. Do something. I'm not a doctor of medicine. Come on, we can make friends. Oh, don't be ridiculous, child. Why? You treat everybody and everything as something less important than yourself. You're trying to say that everything you do is reasonable and everything I do is inhuman. Well, I'm afraid your judgment's a fault, Miss Wright, not mine. Haven't you realized if these two people can follow these, or if any of these people can follow us, the whole tribe might descend upon us at any moment? The tribe is asleep. And what about the old woman who cut our bonds, hmm? You understand? Hmm? He's right. We're too exposed here. We'll make a stretch in the canyon. We're not going to take him back to the ship. Take your coat off, Barbara. Susan, yes. try and find me two poles, long ones, fairly straight. The old woman won't give us away. She helped. Do you think so? Now, in stark contrast to uh, William Hartnell's kind of hard-edged doctor and not really caring about people, but he does, of course, care. On, on a deeper level, and we get into that later. When we start with the Patrick Troughton episodes, you're in for a real treat, something completely different. Um, how, what is the essential difference between the two? The essential difference is that Patrick Troughton is a clown, or at least his character is played as a clown. Um, you might refer to him as an ineffectual genius. Uh, his friendly nature made him a favorite of school children uh, in Britain, and it is that period in which it became, uh, really became known as something that children wanted to see on a, on a regular basis. His catchphrase is definitely, appearances aren't everything you know. And indeed, his style was to deal with a villain by putting him off balance, by not being as smart or as intelligent in appearance as he actually was. Now, he was also a bit of a, a musical clown as well. He, he played the, uh, the recorder yeah. and uh, did a bit of singing on occasion, right? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. It was all part of the idea that this was, this was, a, this was a, a hero who did not take himself very seriously at times. But, but took the took the situation seriously, but not himself. Great. It's a very very important way of putting it. Now, he used to do all kinds of little things like stall and a lot of sight gags and things, in many ways kind of a, a precursor to the sort of thing that Tom Baker would do later on. Yes, that's true. I think we have a clip of that. We sure do. This is uh, from a scene in the Crotons, and it'll give you an idea of what Patrick Troughton can be like when he's stalling for Tom. We won't ruin the scene for you, but here's an enjoyable part of it. Now then, uh, <coughs> where do you want us to stand? Unimportant. Oh, well, I'll stand over here then. Oh, oh, Doctor, I want you to stand there. Oh, my dear. Oh, well, you stand there and I'll stand here. Better still. A much better idea. I'll stand here and you stand here. Turn the headsets or you will be dispersed. All right, all right. How do, how do you wear these things? Give, me, give it time. Oh! Fingers. Doctor, you are clumsy. Enough of this. Put on the headset. Well, it's your fault. You're making me nervous. Patrick Troughton is quite a character indeed, and as you begin to see more of the Patrick Troughton episodes, you, you really appreciate his knack for comedy and humor, which, which stayed with the show for some time to come. Now, you've probably noticed that these episodes are in black and white, and there's nothing wrong with your television set. They are in black and white. You have to remember that these episodes are from 1963, and back before the BBC was recording things uh, in videotape and color. They were all recorded in black and white. Pat, what is the, the story behind a lot of the recovery efforts and why these things are, are preserved the way they are. Okay, well, first of all, the uh, fact that the recovery effort means that a lot of material was lost on Doctor Who because the contracts ran out and they wiped the tapes. That was, that was what the BBC thought was terrific about videotape. You could reuse it, just wipe it and use it over again. They never realized that much of this stuff was going to be important and was going to have a foreign sale ability for them. Uh, videotape was a new gadget to the BBC in 1963, and, and some important technical developments hadn't been devised, things like uh, electronic editing. They shot everything in the order it was going to be shown. They didn't shoot everything on one set and then electronically edit it into the proper order the way they do today. So that even when you see a cliffhanger, the cliffhanger then the following week was shot completely new as opposed to the way we're used to seeing it today. Kind of like reinventing the wheel every time you do something. <laughs> exactly. Um, what we're going to show you right now is a bit of Patrick Troughton in color. This was from an episode that was taped during John Pertwee's era. One of the nice things about Doctor Who, of course, is you can go back in time to revive characters. A little bit of what it was like working with two doctors and then John Pertwee's reaction to working with this incredible colleague. You see, Joe, I may call you Joe, mayn't I? You see, he is one of me. Oh, I see. You're both Time Lords. Well, quite. Well, not quite. Oh. Not 
not just Time Lords. We're the same Time Lord. Now, please, you're only confusing my assistant. Joe, it's all quite simple. I am he, and he is me. And we are all together, Goo Goo Kichu? Mm -hmm. What? It's a song by the Beatles. Oh, how does it go? Oh, please be quiet. Look, is he really you? Yes, yes, I'm afraid so. But I think he is, Miss Ruff. You see, when the Brick and I first met the Doctor, he looked like him. How? Yeah, that's what I'd like to know. You've got no right to be here. Perhaps. Talk about the first law of time. Perhaps I could explain. This was quite traumatic, uh, because P uh, Pat has a completely different way of working to me. Um, he, uh, he, 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 he doesn't like to be bound down too much by uh, cues and dialogue. And so he'd throw something at you, which there'd be a long pause, and somebody would say, well, go on. And I'd say, who? He said, you. And I said, well, if I'm given the cue, I might go on. He said, oh, for Christ's sake, Pat said, that's near enough, isn't it? <laughs> and I'd say, no, it isn't. I don't work that way. He said, well, my lads always did. I said, you, you, but your lads knew how you worked. I don't. So uh, after a few days, we, uh, we got pretty close to each other and uh, um, we became very good friends. And we, I, le we, we learned, I learned how he worked. The one and only John Pertwee, Doctor Number Three. We've got more coming up for you right here on Doctors Who Old and New. We'll have our exclusive interview with Doctor Number Six, Colin Baker, following these words from a fan of Colin Baker on the streets of London. <laughs> I, I like the whole thing, really. All the special effects, the lighting, the whole thing. I love it completely. Who's your favourite doctor? Um, one, the present one now. Colin Baker. Yeah, Colin Baker. How come? What you, what's so special about Colin? Well, the clothes he wears and the, his hairstyle. I like it. I'm not sure what to do with it, but I just like him a lot. How long have you been watching Doctor Who? Um, ever since I could see, um, about eight years now. Or almost as long as I've been alive. Welcome back to Doctors Who Old and New. Eric Luskin along with my co-host Patrick Daniel O'Neill. We are going to be talking about Colin Baker coming up. Colin Baker is the sixth doctor. He followed up on the heels of Peter Davison. And uh, Colin Baker will be starting on New Jersey Network the last Saturday of every month beginning in October. So the last Saturday in October you will see the very first Colin Baker episode, The Twin Dilemma here on New Jersey Network. Pat, what do we have to look forward to when it comes to Colin Baker? Very unusual kind of character. Yeah, um, first of all, just, just in terms of his costume, uh, the, the, the wildest, most uh, tasteless costume, and that's John Nathan Turner's, the producer's own words, it's a tasteless costume. And uh, Colin as a man is a very intellectual and erudite, uh, fascinating person, and a lot of that comes out in, in the way he plays the doctor. Uh, to give you an example, uh, John Nathan Turner says that the reason he thought that Colin Baker was a perfect doctor was that he was able to keep a table full of professional television people entertained at a wedding reception. And none of them, you know, no, nobody got bored because Colin Baker was just that fascinating a person. Anytime you can keep a bunch of television professionals entertained, you're doing pretty well. Let's take a look at the regeneration scene. This, um, some fans may have missed or may not get to see. This is when uh, Peter Davison's doctor was regenerating and turning into Colin. And the wild outfit that we were talking about before is not in evidence in this scene because Colin, of course, has not had a chance to change his clothes. Um, you kind of, it's almost like cloning. You get cloned into your clothes when you regenerate, at least in this particular scene. What's, how does this all happen? Now, Peter gets okay. Ill, Peter's doctor Peter, gets ill. Yeah, Peter's doctor is suffering from spectrox toxemia, which oh, no. he's gotten on the planet Andrazani Minor. And uh, so this is he, as what happens with the Time Lord. If you are gravely injured, but not in a case that will, you, you will die immediately, you change into a different person. In this case, Peter Davison changes into Colin Baker right about now. Doctor? You're expecting someone else? I... I, I... That's three eyes in one breath. Makes you sound a rather egotistical young lady. What's happened? Change, my dear. And it seems on a moment too soon. To put the story a little bit into context, I played a smallish part in an episode of uh, Peter Davison's second season, uh, a story called Arc of Infinity, in which I played a guy called Maxill, who was the chief of security on Gallifrey, which, as you probably know, is the Doctor's home planet. And the Doctor uh, went back to Gallifrey, uh, having been summoned by the Time Lords, 
Uh, I arrested him in a brutal fashion by shooting him, carted him off where he was then executed again by me uh, in the character of Maxwell. So th there's a lot of uh, speculation around that in fact I acquired the part by doing grievous bodily harm to Peter Davison. That was not in my mind at the time, it has to be said. Uh, as a result of that, I met John Nathan Turner, who was the, was and is the producer of Doctor Who. Uh, I think that he couldn't believe that I was playing the part of Maxwell in the way I was playing it. Um, basically, he was a smallish, unimportant character, and I played it as if it was the most important role ever been written for television. In other words, I went right over the top. Uh, so, I think it was that quality which he sensed might be suitable for the doctor to replace Peter Davison. Your guards will not allow me to leave the console room. They have their orders. If I'm to die, I want to prepare myself mentally. For that, I need to be alone. Which is the nearest room? My companions, it has already been searched. Then you may withdraw. But be sensible, doctor. If you try to lose yourself in the corridors of the TARDIS, my men will hunt you down. And your death will be far from dignified and painless. When Peter said he was leaving, John rang me up and asked me to come and see him and told me that's what it was about. He tells me, and I'm very flattered, that uh, I was the only person that he was considering. And he wouldn't have started considering anybody else until we had been through whatever process we had to go through to decide whether I wanted to do it or not. That's great. Yeah, actually, John seems to work that way. I guess I gather that yes. that's what he did with Peter as well. Yeah, that's rather nice. It's certainly flattering. Yeah. An point. interesting corollary to that story is the fact that when I read in the newspapers some what, five years ago now, four or five years ago, that uh, Tom Baker was leaving the part. I rang my agent immediately and said, look, get on to that, because that's a part I would like to get my greedy little hands on. Because I think you, and I'm quite right, I think it would be great fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he rang back and said, sorry, they've already cast it. It's not been announced to the press yet, but it's already been offered. And that obviously was Peter. So it was quite nice to be on the receiving end the next time. I find, I find the actual scene of regeneration the most difficult thing I've had to do since I've taken the part on. Because, um, in practice, what happened was that Peter Davison was making the story, Caves of Androzani, on one of the studio days, I had to come in uh, to do, essentially, three lines. Uh, which meant that I came in in the morning, so I was there. They were behind schedule, which meant that they were having, unfortunately, to cut various scenes as they went along, because they weren't going to finish in time otherwise. So there was an atmosphere of busyness there. Uh, all I had to focus on was that one very short scene. And any actor will tell you the most difficult things to do are small parts, because you focus all your attention and uh, concentration on that small part. If you're playing the, the lead part, you can't think about the whole of it all the time. So you just have to steam in and get on with it. Playing a little scene like that means it gets a disproportionate amount of your um, involvement. So I was waiting around for hours in order to nip quickly into the TARDIS and lie on the floor and sit up and say those three lines with Nicola. Uh, it's not that I actually got particularly nervous about it, but uh, instead of doing it in a relaxed way, I, I was over-endowing it with importance, which meant that I personally am not over-pleased with that very brief scene. It's, it's fine, it's acceptable, but I'd like to do it again now and just slip it into the middle of something else I was doing so that it was uh, more to my satisfaction. How long was it before you did subsequent episodes of your own? Well, Im immediately. Uh, it was John Nathan Turner's decision that, uh, unlike the case in previous cases, when the, the Doctor had uh, regenerated at the end of a series and the British public had waited for a year to see what was going to happen, uh, in this particular case, the, uh, the regeneration took place at what would have been the penultimate story of the season. So the following week, the public saw my first story, which was, I forgot the name, Twin Dilemma, The Twin Dilemma. Um, for reasons of their own, the distributors over here decided to hold that story back and put it on the front of uh, the, the Colin Baker, in quotes, package um, when that comes. But uh, in, in Britain, it was done straight away. So I went straight into rehearsal after that for the first story. Which was quite nice for me. It yeah, I would think it would give you a uh, much better it. because yes. you have to kind of adopt the character and figure out how you're going to play the role and then you and then do to discard it for another five, yes. six months until they go around shooting. Yes. I mean, it seems very strange now, having worked on the series for almost a year, to know that I've got nothing to do for the next two months. Um, I can't <laughs> wait to get back. I, I've seen the first script for the next series and it's a very good one. I can't wait to get into it. 
What did you go through as an actor in preparing yourself to take on the role? Did you decide that you were going to play it a certain way and you knew that John would approve of that way, or did you actually sit down in a process of deliberation, how am I going to deal with X, Y, or Z? Yes, well, we, during that period between him first suggesting that he thought I might be suitable to play the part and him subsequently offering it to me, there were a period of about four or five weeks when I went away with some old tapes of uh, all the, my predecessors, not with any intention of copying what they were doing, but just so that I could almost subliminally assimilate whatever quality that it is that is common to all of the doctors. And there are um, various essentials which are the doctor. Uh, not that I could write them down in a list, but you sort of get to feel it after a while. And then uh, I came to meet with John and the script editor and the, the head of um, the series department of the BBC, and we discuss the way, in general terms, I thought I would like to play the part. And they said what they saw in me that made them think of me as being suitable. And it turned out that we were, I mean, within very narrow margins in total agreement. So uh, then the writers were briefed to write the stories, and we just took off from there. I mean, I, there were characteristics which I wanted to enhance. Um, they are always been there. I mean, I, I wanted my doctor to be, for instance, arrogant, not in a deeply unpleasant way, but uh, uh, to be quite strongly arrogant, wit. I wanted to uh, be fairly active, um, in the same way that Pertwee was a very active physical doctor, I wanted that. I wanted the, the occasional tetchiness of Hartnell, um, some of the off-the-wall kind of uh, offbeat stuff that Troughton produced, the honesty of Peter Davison. Um, and little bits drawn from all the doctors, plus I hope a large amount of something original from myself. Obviously there are bound to be favourites uh, that people have. I, I think people tend to have as the favourite the one they first watched, um, especially if they watched Doctor Who when, in, in the case of England, when they were young children. Then they will always say, oh yes, the best Doctor was, and it turns out to be the one that they w was playing the part when they first started watching it. I, I think that gets less and less the case now it is so firmly established that it's a character which regenerates. For the first couple of times, I mean, especially in the case of Hartnell to Troughton, it must have been a great shock, because it was a very novel idea uh, to have a character which is capable of changing its total appearance. Now it's established. It's happened five times. I'm the sixth Doctor. It's, it's no longer such a great shock. In fact, it's a feature of the program. Uh, it's quite an exciting moment. There's a, it's sadness tinged with excitement. We're losing something very familiar, but something exciting is going to happen. Um, so I, I think I'm benefiting from that at the same time as suffering from the disappointment maybe of some fans. I've had letters ranging through the whole spectrum, some saying, uh, I think you're great, I think you're wonderful, I'm so glad you're playing the Doctor, to others saying, I have stopped watching Doctor Who, now Peter's gone. Um, between the two lies a, a constant, I guess. We, the BBC, and I, John Nathan Turner, make for the home market. We are thrilled to bits that America loves us, that Australia loves us, and New Zealand and Canada. We're absolutely thrilled, of course we are, because financially it benefits our organization. Um, in no way do we try and pander to any market. And if you're about to say, what about the latest companion being American, my answer to that is that, if anything, I suspect that that could do damage to our popularity out here, because I think it's the very Britishness of the show that is so popular. What we're trying to do is, is produce a show that is popular, that is a good science fiction adventure series. End of story. That is our aim. And that's what we do. And so far we've been tremendously successful. The show has been running 22 years. I, I can't say any more than that, really. We don't um, overanalyze the whole thing. It is mind-blowing in its way, in that you say, for example, let us give the master a new regeneration. And the research that then has to go into it, and what has been established, that you have to reflect on, is quite ginormous, really. I think, in a way, the show ought to have a, a resident historian who could 
point us, you know, in the direction in, in kind of very easy stages because he'd be so knowledgeable. For my script editor and I, tackling that history, which we have done, we haven't shied off it, we've deliberately attempted in the last few years to bring back a lot of old monsters, a lot of old villains, um, not quite to wallow in the history, but to acknowledge it. No long-running show should ignore what's gone before. It's very, very important. Um, and it's in, in no way an attempt to pander to the fans either. But the casual viewer will suddenly see the sea devils and say, I was a child when they were last in the show. I remember them. They did this, 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 this. That cannot be ignored, not on something that's so ongoing, that is, as the Guardian newspaper pointed out, as traditional as tea and crumpets. You know, I'm often asked, do you prefer working with Tom to Peter? Do you prefer working with Colin to Patrick? That there isn't an answer to it, because you, you can't compare six very different people. As I say, their only common denominator, if you like, is their talent. John Nathan Turner, the show's current producer. Next Saturday at 9, you can appreciate the talents of William Hartnell as New Jersey Network brings you that premiere. Time has flown. Pat, thanks for being here. We leave you on the streets of London. Some people don't know the names of their favorite doctors. Can you believe that? Well, it's an escape from reality, isn't it? Uh, my children love it, so I'm forced to watch it. How long have you been watching, and who's your favorite doctor? Uh, 22 years, and my favorite doctor is the first one. What do you, what do you remember about, most about William Hartnell? His white hair, and it was longer than mine, and longer than Harold Wilson's. No, no, who's the very first oh, one? no, that was... No, who's the very first one with the lo whitish blonde hair? Yeah, that was... Yeah, totally yeah. don't. Norman Hartnell, I think. He was uh, one of the first uh, Doctor Who. What did you like about him? Uh, well, he was a very good actor. And he fitted into the part quite well. Who's your favourite? Doctor Who? Yeah. Well, the one I was brought up with. Um, Bill Pertwee. Well, no, not Bill Pertwee. I think Bill Pertwee is my favourite Doctor. Tom Pertwee. Yeah, John Pertwee, when he were in it. How come? Oh, they were very good, though. Like, they were all, uh, like, more adventure and all that. Uh, you know, it's funny. And it's when I was little, you used to scare me. Got a good question of facts. I like the TARDIS as well. I like the TARDIS as well. How come? Um, because I like the way it disappears and comes back in different, different places. Who's your favorite doctor? Um, the one we've got now. Colin Baker? Yes. Good. How about you? Who do you... All the slimy monsters. Yeah, and me. And me. I like the slimy monsters as well. What else? And I like the TARDIS because it disappears and it goes into spaceships. I like the buttons on the spaceship as well. What I like, else? Well, I like the way how they've got all these levers and um, how the doctor takes the parts away from the other um, <laughs> machines. Okay. I like all the robots, all the Daleks. I like um, the TARDIS because the doors open and close all closes automatically. It's British tradition, Doctor Who, and I don't think they should take it off. It's just like abandoning the royal family. Where would children be without Doctor Who? <laughs> <laughs> they, they wouldn't have any child.